So hello, everyone. Hi, thank you so much for joining us for tonight's AEM Jedi mentoring session. We have a wonderful esteemed panel of speakers who will be talking to us today all about egg freezing. I know it's something that definitely interests me in residency. I ended up doing it my fourth year of residency. And I think uh, all of the speakers here will be able to give you a lot of good insight on why, why they chose to freeze their eggs. Um, so we'll get right to it. I have a great panel of Dr. Victoria Gonzalez, Dr. Tatiana Carrillo, Dr. Alyssa Alloy, who will all be speaking to you today. And um, we'll let uh, Dr. Gonzalez open us up with the process of egg freezing. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So everybody's process is going to be a little bit different, but there is just sort of a general timeline about what happens. So after your initial testing and evaluation with your fertility doctor, you're going to go in on day three of your menstrual cycle for some baseline blood work and a baseline ultrasound. From there, you're going to start a combination of medications that are going to be probably combined oral and injectable. And this is the stimulation phase of the egg freezing. So at this time, you're trying to recruit different follicles. And then at some point, your doctor is going to add a medication that's going to prevent ovulation. And so um, during this time, you're going to go in for monitoring approximately every two to three days. And then at some point, you will reach um, the trigger shot. And so this is when you've recruited a sufficient amount of follicles to trigger. You'll give yourself this injection. And approximately 36 hours later, you're going to go in for your egg retrieval. The egg retrieval is an outpatient procedure, and it's a transvaginal ultrasound guided aspiration of the follicles. Um, so like I said, everybody's timeline is gonna be different. Some people are gonna stem for shorter or longer. Everybody's egg numbers are gonna be different, and the combination of medicines is gonna be specific to you, and it's gonna be dictated by your doctor. Thank you for that, Dr. Gonzalez. I think that really gave us a good overview of what it takes uh, to freeze your eggs. So I'd like each of the panelists to come off mute and just introduce yourselves. If we can start with Dr. Gonzalez, since you're already on the screen, if you could tell us your name, where you trained, what you're doing now, we'd love to hear that. Sure, so I'm Victoria Gonzalez. I did my training at Cook County Hospital. I'm now full-time faculty in the emergency department there. And I did egg freezing both as a fourth year resident and then also as an attending. Awesome. Dr. Carrillo? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Tatiana Carrillo. I trained at St. Barnabas in the Bronx. Excuse my dog as she also introduces herself to you guys. <laughs> um, and I am currently a uh, assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. I actually just completed my egg freezing process about three weeks ago. Um, and I think this kind of session would have been very useful to me during my residency as well. So I'm very, very lucky that we're having this conversation now. And Dr. Alloy. Hi everyone, I'm Alyssa. I did my training at Einstein in Philadelphia um, and a fellowship year at Temple. And now I'm full-time emergency faculty at Christiana in Delaware. Awesome. Um, so, oh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Keep going. And I froze my eggs back in 2019. Wonderful. Okay. So we have kind of a varying time at which everyone froze their eggs. So we'll get into that more later. Um, so we're going to just jump into questions. First, I just want everyone to know that this is a safe space. We are here to learn, so don't feel like any question is too trivial or too basic. Um, we all wish we would have had this when we were going through the process, so we really want you to get your questions answered. The second is that there are some pre-made questions that we will be asking, but you can interrupt at any time. This is really to benefit you and to get your specific questions answered. So if you have a question, please either raise your hand and then come off mute and ask your question, or you can type anything into the chat and we would love to answer it. Um, so just a little background. So in 2012, uh, the American Society for Assisted Reproductive Technology actually deemed egg freezing, so the process of oocyte cryopreservation to no longer be experimental. 
Um, so obviously at that time we saw an explosion in this process actually being done. It was estimated in 2021 that over um, 24,000 egg freezing cycles were initiated. Um, so it all depends on when you want to freeze your eggs. Some people choose to do it in medical school, during gap years, during residency, as an attending. Um, but I wanted to know from each of the panelists, what made you want to freeze your eggs? I can start. Um, so I did a year of ob in residency before switching to emergency medicine. So one of my electives had been to do a reproductive endocrinology and infertility elective, which was a really awesome experience. And what I found out from that experience that most surprised me is how many women thought that they had so much more time to get pregnant or to have children. And how many of them, by the time they were 32, 33, 34, 35, were just surprised that they had trouble with it. And so I had a really great mentor during that time who talked me through the process and was like, it's better to get testing done sooner so that you know kind of where you are on your fertility journey. And you might have lots of time or you not, might not have that much time. And so in residency, I started that process and I found out that I was on the side that maybe needed to get started with my family planning sooner rather than later. And I was also in that boat where I was like, well, I don't want kids now. And I don't know if I want kids later, but I at least want to have the option. I can go next. Um, I think I, so I started medical school later. I started medical school when I was 28. Um, and I started residency 32 now. So I started much later in, in the process and, as many of us, or we go back and forth about, you know, family planning, having children, you know, I think there is a lot of just even stigma attached to having that conversation about, do you want kids? Because there's so much of the female identity attached to having children and just the ability to have children is something you don't even want to kind of even have that conversation with yourself. Um, I think throughout my training, I was always of the mindset that I was very much focused on, on my career and my training, and I did not want to have children. And which is why I really didn't pursue, pursue egg freezing at all in residency. And now entering my second year of an attending, I'm 37 and you're, you change from year to year, right? Every, every time point, every chapter of your career brings you something new of self-development specifically. And I've come to realize, I'm like, this is not what I want now. It may be what I want in a year. So let me take advantage of this opportunity. So I decided to go ahead and um, go throughout the process um, very recently. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll go next. Um, actually, so when I was in med school, I had a good friend who is also an emergency medicine physician now who was very big advocate about um, egg freezing for female physicians and you know, preserve, having the option to preserve your fertility. So it was something that was on my radar, like on the earlier side, um, and then became a very, very large topic among my other, you know, female physician friends. Um, I also went to med school late. I started at 28 and graduated at 32. So I knew when I was a resident that I was not ready to have a kid yet, but I knew that that was something that I wanted for my future. So I kind of just gave myself an age, which was 32, when I decided like, if I still want this and I'm not in a position to have a kid at this time, then that's something that I want to pursue. So I was at, did it during my second year of residency. Great. So sounds like you all kind of thought about where you were in training and, you know, what plans you had for yourself in terms of family planning to really decide when was the right time. Um, so there is some literature out there that is varying in terms of what percentage of uh, frozen eggs go on to result in live births, right? Um, so obviously there's a lot that goes into the process of unfreezing the egg and then combining it with the sperm to make an embryo. And then do you freeze that embryo or are you implanting that embryo and all these other steps? Um, but from a 2020 review, there was an estimate that about 39% of all 
um, frozen eggs uh, actually result in live births for a large clinic in New York City. Um, they found, though, that that number was over 50% for people who froze their eggs at a younger age, so less than uh, the number was age 38, or for those who had a plethora of eggs, right? So they had 20 or more frozen uh, metaphase two cycle eggs that were frozen. So the more eggs you freeze, obviously, the more your chance of having a live birth, and then the younger when you freeze your eggs. If you were to, if you had a medical student come up to you today and just say, hey, I don't know if I want to be a mom um, at this point in time, but uh, I think that I may want to freeze my eggs, when would you tell them would be an ideal time? What would be some things they need to consider? Um, I think that, you know, I think there is a lot of personal um, circumstances that you have to really reevaluate when you're making this decision. Um, one of the biggest ones, especially if you are a resident in training, is cost. Um, does your insurance cover this? Uh, a lot of the times, fortunately, a lot of insurances are covering um egg freezing. There are some nuances though, with what they will cover, whether they will just cover the procedure, your medications are not covered or your free, your storage fee is not covered. So there's a lot of financial nuances. I would say definitely educate yourself on what is covered. And then once you have that, if there is a gap in cost, can you afford it? Right. Um, do you have, you know, a partner that will offset whatever the outline cost is, and I think there is a lot that goes in from an emotional and mental readiness into doing this process, especially if you do not have a partner, you're doing this by yourself. Um, injecting yourself is something that's not easy, right? And it, it's a daily process. Um, and just really finding support in someone who's done it, I feel like it's very beneficial throughout the process. Just someone that you can call and be like, Hey, I don't feel well today. I'm on day X of cycle. Can I come hang or something? So I think really getting your a support system in play, getting your finances in play and just of course scheduling, right? Because you do need a certain amount of time off your, your schedule needs to be a, at least a little bit more flexible so that you can make those every other day appointments. So planning ahead, I would say, give yourself some time. Maybe if you're a resident, um, maybe on some elective time, I wouldn't say do it on vacation, right? Cause we all deserve vacation time, but definitely during a time that you have a little bit more flexibility. Yeah, I agree. I think that cost plays a big, big role. And then also, you know, you don't have to go see an infertility doc necessarily, but see your gynecologist and see like, where am I with my health? Am I in a place where my body could withstand this? Are there things that are impacting my fertility, like my thyroid that I maybe don't know about so that your doctor can do kind of your general exam, get your pap smear, and then see, are my hormones in order? Is there some imbalance? Is there something that needs to be addressed before I take on this like huge journey of egg freezing? And yeah, I mean, I'll just... Oh, yeah. I was it, just going to reiterate oh, most like, of the same exactly things. Exactly I mean. how you did it since you were a resident as well, just so we kind of get a timeline. Me? Um, so um, I was just gonna say like, cost and timing and support system are definitely the three largest things that will help you accomplish this successfully. Um, so when I was a, I did not do what I would necessarily recommend to other people, but I will serve as an example to let you know that it can be done this way. Um, I had, I chose to do this process like in the winter. And unfortunately I had strings of only emergency rotations. Um, so I frequently in my, in the way our residency worked had three days off um, in a row. So I, for me, when I went to do this and I found a doctor that I liked, I was very adamant about fitting this process into my schedule. You know, as a resident, like you prioritize your work so much. It's probably often why we're doing this. Um, so I found someone to help me accommodate this whole process into my very strict resident schedule. So it is certainly possible. You just have to also be an advocate for yourself and, you know, let the doctors and the nurses know, like, 
you can't come in this day because you have to be at work at 6.30 in the morning, but you can come the next day when you're post night. Um, and that worked for me. Awesome, thank you. Um, I know for myself, so I had planned to do it during an elective. I went through everything. I was, you know, basically ready, had my pre-blood work and all these things. And then I get my pre-ultrasound and it says I have a fairly large ovarian cyst. So they had to delay my cycle. Um, and then, so based on our schedule, right, I was in my last year of residency. So I had to delay it further than just a month because I was like, I'll be on my EM rotations or what have you, it'll be heavy. Um, so I waited till I had another elective and actually chose that time. But I remember literally, um, you know, being on my elective, it was pediatric EM and being there and like having to sneak to the bathroom to like inject myself. So it can be done. It does take a little bit of planning, uh, especially as a resident. Um, getting back to that, did any of you all tell your program director or for those who did this uh, when they were attending, did you tell your boss, were you open with it or did you just say, hey, I'll need this time off and it was your personal business? How did you go about that? Um, so I didn't, was very private about it. I think I shared with two friends, one who was a fertility nurse and one who had already done IVF. Um, who were very good for information and relatability. Uh, and I did not tell anyone that I worked with. Um, I, part of the reason why I was so adamant about putting it into my like days off so that I wouldn't have to ask off. Um, ultimately, in the end, I did share with the chief president because they tried to call me into work on the retrieval day. And I had to say that I couldn't come and explained why. And they were all very accepting. Um, it wasn't really until I heard other physicians and people who were my peers saying that they wanted to do it. They were curious. And felt like it was beneficial to be open about the experience and, you know, let people know that this can be done. Yeah, I, w I was the opposite. I told absolutely everybody, probably people who didn't want to know anything about it. Um, part of that just comes from my experience doing ob -GYN. I was like, you should know about this. You should look into this. If you're not ready to have kids right now, I knew that the insurance at my program covered it or covered a large portion of it. And I wanted to make sure that as many of my classmates could take advantage of it while we were residents. I ended up, um, I ended up telling my close, like my close group of just friends at work and my immediate, like whoever are like, whoever was managing the on-call system uh, for that week of, I knew when I possibly could be retrieved. Um, I told them, I'm like, Hey, you know, I'm doing X, Y, Z. I'm trying to swap out of a shift, right? I'm like, but just just FYI, you may have to activate a Jeopardy shift, right? So I kind of gave them the heads up just so that they were aware from, from an administrative like scheduling perspective. So going back to something you all mentioned, let's talk more about the coins. How much does this cost? I know you said, you know, some insurances cover it, others do not. Um, just a quick Google search, I found that there are two clinics actually uh, that cover it for resident, well, reduced price for residents, but one is located in DC, the other is in New York. So obviously, if you're not close, that's not really feasible. But do you all remember exactly how much you spent or a ballpark area? And what are some options for people who feel like this is too expensive? How would you suggest they afford this? Um, well, I just finished doing it. So I have the, I have the numbers very at my forefront. Um, I decided just to freeze um, oocytes. So I did not um, freeze embryos. The process, the procedure itself was $7,000, which my insurance covered. Um, they do most insurances, at least from what I know, don't really cover your storage fee, which is something that you should know, right? Because there is a yearly, there's yearly rent that we have to pay for, for our oocytes. They do not cover that. And there are certain insurance plans that do not cover your medications. Um, my meds were, I want to say 75% covered. 
their total cost before insurance even kicked in was about $15,000, um, which my insurance covered a lot, a good portion. I ended up paying about 2000 for meds. Um, so that's pretty much, I put in about 2000 bucks, which is whatever the medications covered, but everything else the insurance did cover. I don't remember exact numbers. That sounds about right. I think talking to my classmates who also froze their eggs through my program, it was about 1500 to $2,000. And I think, right, like you're a resident, it's not like you have a lot of money to spare to like put into this. Um, and that's why I think earlier planning and, and trying to save for it had to be part of the process as well. Um, but it's like any other insurance, right? Life insurance, disability insurance, you have to put in the money up front to have that insurance on the back end. Um, I had saved quite a bit of money because I was expecting the whole process to cost about ten to twelve thousand um, dollars. I did not realize our my residency insurance, which I felt was not always the most all encompassing, actually covered like three quarters of it, which was ended up just being a pleasant surprise. I did not do this through my institution. I did this through a practice doctor, like totally unrelated. I think in the end, after my medication, I I spent about three thousand um, dollars. But that was very variable on the prices of the medication. Like if you need one extra dose of medicine, that's another five hundred dollars just to get that one extra dose. So that can still very much vary from person to person. And I think something that you should know if you're doing this, and this is like a nuanced thing that I think a lot of us probably don't realize is your, in your coverage is really, it also takes into account your deductible for your insurance. So if you're early, if you're deciding to do this, depending on when your institution, your new benefits take, take into effect, if you're doing it early on, you may not have your deductible covered. So you, your deductible may actually be in like incorporated in the cost. So that's also something to be mindful of if you have the health insurance that has high deductibles um, attached to them. If you decide to do it after your deductible is spent, you can actually save yourself at least you know, a couple thousand bucks. Also, just because no one else mentioned it, the cost of storage is about eight hundred. And for me, I'm not sure everybody else. It was about it's about eight hundred fifty dollars a year, which is another hefty price to pay. And keep in mind that you gotta keep doing that if you want to keep them frozen. Right. So sounds like you're saying about almost a thousand for storage every year, and then maybe two to three thousand for the med. So you're looking at four to five thousand dollars if you're really planning to do this, which can be a lot for a resident. Um, so where did you actually get your medications? Obviously at a pharmacy. I know when I went through the process, there was a small specialty pharmacy that you could go to that offered the meds that were a little bit discounted. And then also sometimes your own institution pharmacy, but were you able to just like pull up to CVS and get these medications or were they mailed to you? How did you actually get the medications in hand? Uh, mine were connected through one of the large universities here. Um, this private practice had a partnership with them to be able to get their meds through that hospital pharmacy. So I walked over into that pharmacy and picked it up by hand. Um, I do have to add that I also, one of the reasons I chose this doctor aside from great recommendations is that it's two blocks from where I live. So going the convenience and of that accessibility, I mean, for the meds also was also very valuable to me. I actually had mine delivered through the pharmacy attached to my insurance. So they were all delivered directly to my house. And I actually ended up needing like an extra dose um, of medications, which the practice I did my freezing through, they were great and they actually gave me a free dose. So I didn't have to like pay for an extra dosage, but it sometimes does happen. Yeah, I didn't have a choice in, in pharmacy. It was whatever the insurance decided. And so all the medications were delivered as well. So um, this is a question from the chat. Have any of you actually utilized your eggs yet? And what is the process once you decide, I, I actually want to use um, the oocytes that I have frozen? 
I have not used mine yet. I'm ideally hoping that I won't have to use them, um, but I'll let someone with more experience explain the actual process of using them. I just will let you know I have not used mine yet. Yeah, I have not used mine um, as of yet either. I have not used mine. I have thawed um, from the different cycles. So I should also say, you know, you go into this process thinking I'm going to do one cycle of egg freezing. I'm going to get all the eggs I need and then, you know, I'll be done with this and it's going to feel so great. So uh, I think have had the experience that many women have had, which is you need multiple cycles. Um, and in my case, I've been through maybe six cycles. Some of them have not all progressed all the way through. Uh, part of that was because of COVID. It was either I got COVID or my doctor got COVID and it was before the vaccine. So lots of different variables that can throw a wrench into this process. Um, so I do have eggs from a former cycle that I wanted to create embryos from. And so for that, uh, we pulled the eggs out of storage. They have to go through a thaw cycle. And then from there, they try to inseminate them. And so of those eggs, they won't all survive the thaw process. And then they won't all necessarily survive the insemination process. And then from there also, they have to want to create embryos unless you're ready in that moment to have the egg or embryo transferred, then frozen eggs becomes frozen embryos. So it's this sort of freeze thaw cycle. And you wanna to try to minimize that, like how many times you have to go through the freezing and thawing. Um, but still trying to get to the appropriate number of eggs for family planning. So I think there's probably some more cycles in, in my future. And can any of you speak on what actually happens to your oocytes if you, if you decide that you no longer want children or you end up getting pregnant without any assisted reproductive technology, what actually happens? There is a very sort of legal decision making that goes into this, at least through through the two practices that I've been through. Uh, and I think the best explanation for it was like the five D's. So before you undergo any of this process, they ask you what to do with your eggs or embryos in case of if you die, if your partner dies, if you get divorced, if you become destitute, right? Like you go bankrupt and you can't pay for it anymore, or if you disappear, like you just go into a fugue state and you no longer are around. So you have to decide in each of those scenarios what you're gonna do with those, um, with that frozen tissue. And it might be, I want the frozen tissue to go to my partner. I want the frozen tissue to go to this specific person. I want the frozen tissue to be discarded or I want the frozen tissue to be donated either for research purposes or to couples who are struggling with infertility. Great. So it sounds like there are some options if you decide not to use the oocytes yourself. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, how you may tell a partner. Were all of you partnered at the time when you decided to freeze your eggs? If not, um, let's also talk about how you talk about it if you're single, right? So they're trying to Netflix and chill. You're talking about when are we going to the clinic to create embryos, right? So like, this is not first day conversation, but when, when do you bring it up? So for were all of you partnered at the time of freezing your eggs? Was anyone single? So I was single at the time that I froze them um, and then COVID happened right after. Um, but then I met my now partner about six months after that. Um, I don't remember how soon into dating at least a couple months until we felt serious when I just mentioned, by the way, I, I did this. And he was like, oh, that's wonderful. And we don't discuss it very often. I just asked earlier tonight <laughs> if he had any thoughts about it. His response is the same as it always has been, which is mostly like your body, your choice. Um, I am in a relationship and um when I had the discussion with him and I'm like, Hey, you know, this has always been on my mind. I think I want to do this now. It was very, um, not, it was very much like this, this affects you and you, you and your body holistically. Um, so it's a decision that you should make. Um, we did have like a couple of discussions, uh, because he does have children. So he's like, well, what does that mean for us? So that, that always gets a little weird when that conversation happens because it almost, 
it makes you like reevaluate your relationship in a sense. But um, I think it was the way we, our conversation went was more so we don't know where, where the future holds for anything holistically. And this, this procedure would be more so if, if in case, you know, tomorrow we're, we decide that we're just not a good fit for one another. This is solely, uh, almost he, he says it's a good selfish decision, which I think encompasses the whole thing, right? It's good kind of selfish. <laughs> I was in a relationship, but I, I don't think we were engaged. We certainly weren't married. Um, and I don't think that he thought very much about it just because knowing my background with OB-GYN, he was like, this seems like something you know a lot about and have strong feelings about. And, you know, it's kind of the same as, uh, as Alyssa, like your body, your choice. If you want to proceed with this, that sounds great. Great. That's awesome. So sounds like all of your partners, if you were partnered, were supportive as they should be. Um, and then obviously, if you're single, you should just bring it up when you feel like uh, it's necessary information, but ultimately it is your choice. Um, we did get some more comments in the chat that I'm going to address. So someone did want to know um, in terms of engaging with a fertility specialist, when would you suggest is a good time, right? So I remember for my process, I had some other health issues. So I kind of knew for a while that this is something I was going to do. But let's say from your knowledge, you have no potential uh, barriers to your fertility, but you want to be on the cautious side and freeze eggs. When should you start thinking about having these initial appointments with a fertility specialist? Is it three months ahead of when you think maybe you'd want to um, start the procedure a month. How how long uh, should you wait before you initiate contact with your healthcare provider about this? Um, well, I think I initiated contact when I felt like I was ready to do this, knowing that it wouldn't happen right away. I don't think I realized how long prolonged it. You know, all the evaluations and the pre lab work and you know, making sure you don't have a cyst, I'll take. Um, so it ended up being, for me, it was five months, four or five months um, until every the retrieval from when I first contacted my doctor. I actually started having the discussion during uh, one of my yearly, it was my yearly um, appointment. And I had the conversation. I said, hey, you know, I'm thinking about doing this. And one thing that we discussed was at the time, aside from other, you know, making sure I was okay from a health standpoint, like from a hormonal standpoint and an anatomic standpoint was my BMI may at that time did not allow for me to have the procedure as an outpatient. I had to go undergo like full general anesthesia because my BMI put me at a higher risk at the time. So I delayed for about seven months until I got into an acceptable BMI range. So it was an actual outpatient procedure because I didn't, I didn't want to go under general anesthesia. I didn't want to do, I didn't want to take on those risks involved with it either. And at that time, I know I had to, I had to go back to do subsequent, like multiple checks of my hormones at that time, multiple ultrasounds, just to make sure that I was still on track. Um, to be able to do that in the allotted time frame. I think when you get to a point where you're thinking about it consistently, it's a good time to talk to your regular doctor and ask if they have any connections, anybody that they recommend, see who your insurance um, recommends, and then also taking into account like when your benefits kick in. And then I would start that process sooner rather than later because then they can do the testing. And if everything is smooth sailing and you're like, actually, I have this vacation or this is not a good time for me because of elective, then at least you've already done all the front work. Or if you just need a little bit more time to figure out if this is something you actually want to pursue, at least all that initial legwork, you've already been through it. And they can answer all your questions on, is this the right time for me? Should I do this? These are the things that I have in mind. These are the goals I want to achieve before this or, or why I want to do this. I also add that you should, if you're in your last year of residency um, 
or, you know, fellowship or what have you, you should be thinking about, you know, your coverage and when it expires. So if you are, I know I did mine in May of my last year of residency. So I was cutting it kind of close. If I had to delay uh, the procedure yet again, then I would have maybe come up against graduation and would it be covered because there was a period of time where I went without insurance while waiting for my attending job. But just be mindful of that. Um, if you're in your last year, just because uh, like some of us have said, if you have a delay that that may set everything back. And I know Dr. Carrillo, you mentioned, unfortunately, having some side effects uh, from the procedure, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Can you speak more on that? And can all of you talk about kind of the side effects of the medication, the side effects of the retrieval process, if you had any side effects at all? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, I think um, a lot of the possible side effects, um, there you kind of you read about them they talk to you about them but then when you actually experience them you're just like oh this is like this is real like this really really happens <laughs> um so my process throughout the injection phase was okay I would say like no one likes to inject themselves that's number one right no one that's it's not an enjoyable process to do um I definitely did experience just a lot of nausea I, during, during that time, especially when I got closer to my trigger shot, um, you do experience some weight gain associated with it. Uh, I was just, it, it's just as the closer you get to your retrieval that you just become a little bit more uncomfortable in your own skin. Um, for me specifically, I was told I was a high responder which was that my ovaries love the hormones and they made a lot, a lot of follicles. <laughs> and I, I think it was day six of the process. I was told that I couldn't really work out. I couldn't do anything high intensity. I could not run. I couldn't do, I could do very limited exercise because of the size of my ovaries. Um, so one day I was literally on the treadmill walking and I felt this excruciating pain on my left side. And I was just like, you know, maybe, maybe it's a cramp. Like, let, let me just walk a little slower. And the pain got worse, uh, became so nauseous, so sick. Um, luckily there are systems in place where I did mind that there's an, always an on-call fellow on. And I called and I was like, Hey, I'm concerned that I actually torsed my ovary. So went in, did an ultrasound. Indeed, I torsed and detorsed, um, luckily. And then of, I was on strict activity rest during that time. And then after my retrieval, uh, given the size of my ovaries, I was already at risk for developing ovarian hyperstim and just the amount of follicles that I had. And I did in fact develop ovarian hyperstim syndrome um, within two days of my retrieval. So one of the things is you, there's different gradations of ovarian hyperstim, right? There's like a mild, a moderate, and then like a severe phase. And they'll tell you to monitor your weight after your retrieval. They'll monitor um, your urine output. They'll definitely give you some strict precautions to, for, to monitor. I myself gained 11 pounds in one day after my retrieval. Um, it was all like a huge, like a huge abdomen. So they definitely had me, I had to go in consecutive days immediately after my retrieval, just to monitor that everything was okay, monitor that my hormone levels were dropping. Um, and this, I had my retrieval about three weeks ago now. And it's, I want to say this week that now I feel like I'm back in my own body. Like I feel better. Um, but those are certain, some complications that I definitely can, um, develop. And it really is dependent on yourself and just, it, they do say it is tied about how your the size of your ovaries and how many follicles you already have. So I unfortunately had that experience, but fortunately everything was okay after the fact. Yeah, um, I, I was- I'm a, happy, no. <laughs> so I had um, a different experience, which was that my, my ovaries needed a lot of meds because they were not responding the same way. Um, 
That being said, the majority of my symptoms were nausea, headache, extreme fatigue. Um, it was, I felt like very useless just from the fatigue. And then that was all during the stimulation. And then after, and just like wild mood swings, after the retrieval, like the next day I felt so much better. And it was every time that I've had to, do, I've had friends and classmates who have done it who were like, oh, I felt great during the stimulation. I felt like amazing. Like I could do anything. Like I had this hormone high and the day of the retrieval couldn't get out of bed, couldn't stop crying. So it really does depend on each person. Um, yeah, I feel very lucky. I had very minimal side effects. I remember feeling about halfway through the stimulation, feeling like very overly emotional about things that I wouldn't normally respond to in that way. Um, and then as soon as it was over, every, it all just went away. And I was like, okay, ready to move back on with life. Um, I had like, I know Kristen mentioned uh, like early in the process, I had an ovarian cyst that delayed everything just for another week. Um, but that was pretty minor. Um, I had a really, you know, pretty good experience. I mean, you do feel bloated and kind of uncomfortable, but I guess from what I was anticipating, it was not nearly as bad as I anticipated. I was very selfish and vain even in all of this. And I only wanted to do this procedure in the winter time when I knew I would be wearing like sweatpants and scrubs and wouldn't also make, you know, do anything that would make me feel bad about myself. So I did that for myself as well. I know each of you have already told us kind of, you know, when you did the process and about how long, but can you just throw out like a, how many months it took from your initial appointment to actual retrieval? And an estimate is fine. Uh, I know that I made the decision to do this in August. I think my appointment was probably in September. Um, maybe I we I had given several, you know, small windows where I knew I would be able to do a retrieval in December. Um, and then we worked backwards from that availability since I didn't have like a whole open month to do this. Um, so I would say I think I started really in uh, end of October and had I don't remember the exact timeline, to be honest, somewhere in the middle of the fall. And then I had the retrieval in December. So from August to initiating contact to December, mid-December retrieval. Yeah, I think I started, I had my annual in February and then given my BMI, they wanted me to lose a certain amount of weight. I didn't end up having my retrieval until now in end of July, beginning of August. Yeah, I think mine was about four months. So about four to five months. That's good to know in terms of everyone on the call in case you are thinking about this, just how long it may take. So did any of you all know anyone personally who had frozen their eggs or frozen embryos or who had had any type of procedure like this before? Yeah, a few of my, um, just my friends and throughout the process, they have done it. I knew some um, attendings that they have gone, they went through the whole IVF process, some friend, like close friends of mine as well. Um, so there was a plethora of like different people at different phases to, to actually have those conversations with. I think I knew a couple people that had gone through IVF and so that's sort of the first half the egg raising is sort of the first half of that and so that's who I got my advice from yeah I mean same thing I knew people who had done IVF um, I knew friends who were kind of in parallel doing egg freezing around the same time either a little before a little after um, and yeah that's where I got most of my support from and in information. Uh, so for the panelists who identify as underrepresented in medicine, I know sometimes there can be this thought in minority communities that, you know, why are you freezing your eggs? Your grandma was able to get pregnant naturally, had 10 kids. Last time she was pregnant was at age 50, right? Or 
you know, that this is somehow desperate or, um, you know, not appropriate based on cultural norms. Did you all encounter any of that or have any familial or community um, pushback into freezing your eggs? Um, like my, my sister was very well aware of what I was doing. She was like, yeah, you know, this sounds good. Like you right now you're focused on your career, like go for it. Um, my mother was also, she's like, if you feel like this is what you want to do, go right ahead. Um, I do feel like it took a lot of explanating, ex, um, explanations to my grandmother. And I think it's just because culturally during the time she was raised and now, um, that was even a thought, right? It's like, you have kids, you get married and you, you're a mom, right? Like that's, that's kind of like the three stages of, of what being a woman is, like, is. So, um, having those conversations were a little weird, um, because, you know, she would say, you know, if, if, if God wants you to have a kid, you'll, you'll have it. Like, don't, don't do that. Like if it's meant for you, you'll do it. Or you'll sometimes get, if it's in the cards for you, don't, don't worry about it. And, um, oh, you won't be the first or the last that doesn't have a child or has a child later. And they they always bring up, like, there was a lady in my town back in PR or DR that had a kid at 60, you'll be fine. And it's just like, it's like, no, we're, we're not basing this on some imaginary person back in X village. So I think it definitely took, um, almost, almost like a sternness to say, I don't want to have kids right now. I don't think I want to have kids. I may change my mind, but I'm doing this just in case. And recently she, she kind of came back to me and she's like, you know, this is like my 86 year old grandma who was like born and raised in the Dominican Republic. She's kind of just like, if you don't want to have them, it's okay. She's like, it's fine. She's like, you can be the fun aunt. And I'm just like, cool. Thanks. (laughs) So I think there, I think there is some understanding, but I think holistically it's something that they just may not understand. And that's okay. Right. As long as you have come to terms that this is a decision that you make and some people may not understand and that's okay also. Yeah, I'm Hispanic. And so I think there's this sort of belief that like, number one, of of course, you're going to be a mother, like, of of course, you're going to have children. And then also, of course, it's going to be easy. So I think for my parents, specifically like for my mom, it was probably like, oh, of course you should do fertility preservation because you're, you're going to want to have children later, obviously. And then also like some of that was sort of internalized for me where I was like, oh yeah, like I'm Hispanic, like, of course I'm probably like super fertile and this isn't going to be a problem at all. Um, so it wasn't necessarily challenging to, to tell anybody about it in that sense. Um, but I do think there's some misconceptions about who this affects. And I think there's some statistics out there about how you know, women of color tend to struggle with infertility as much, if not more, but don't have the same access to care that, that others do. Right. Um, that's true. I, I feel like it's a, you know, people are just a little bit hesitant for things they don't understand. And um, I know sometimes in my own family, it's like, well, aren't you you know, the goal is not to get pregnant. So then when you're like, I want to preserve your, my fertility, then they're like, oh, okay, that's a little bit different, but obviously um, it's your choice in your body. So now I think is a great time to open it up to questions. If there are any lingering questions that you didn't get to put in the chat, you can just come off mute, introduce yourself, and then uh, just ask your questions. So I think I got most of the chat questions. If I did not, please come off mute and um, you can ask your question. Hi, I'm Tabitha. Um, I'm a med student. Um, I'm also Hispanic. I just wanted to say thank you guys for sharing Um, I think this, the cultural struggle of like just being expected to have kids is one thing. And then also like figuring out if like, that's something that you want out of your own volition, or if it's just like an ingrained thing. So thank you so much for sharing. We really appreciate it. Um, It's super helpful. 
Um, and it's something that I've been thinking about for a while. So thank you so much. Thank you for joining Tabitha. Any other final questions? All right, so I think this is, there's been a lot of comments in the chat, just how you guys are really, they appreciate all the stories you've been sharing, um, including your own experiences. Uh, also someone commented that they felt like they had a lot, of, had they had to have a lot of family conversations as a person of color uh, with family members just not understanding. So this really makes them feel um, better and like they're not the only ones going through it. So I think this is a great time to kind of end the discussion. Um, I wanted to just quickly have each of the panelists tell us if, you know, again, if you're a medical student who's joining the call or a resident, what are two things that you would suggest that everyone does um, to start thinking about preserving their fertility if they choose to do so? Um, I think number one is make sure your finances from an insurance standpoint are in order, right? Um, see, ask, call your HR department, find out when your benefits kick in, when you're set to renew your benefits, what your coverage is. Is this a lifetime coverage? Is this a per cycle coverage? And are your medications included? I think those are the first things to take off your plate and your mental plate, your mental load as well, right? Do I have to financially come up with $4,000 for this? If, if you have full coverage for that, great. And then I would say... Secondly is find someone you trust, whether it's a co-resident, an attending, a fellow, someone that's not in medicine, just a friend who's done, either has done the process or is considering the process and have just conversations, like find a sounding board throughout this process because there is a mental component that goes into it and just you start thinking to yourself of like, why am I doing this? Do I want to do this? And sometimes it's really good to have someone who's in that from the outside looking in to kind of help you throughout that. Um, I'll echo all those things and also just, you know, have a conversation with your gynecologist or primary care doctor about just like, what are their thoughts? Because sometimes it is helpful to also have an objective person, you know, either hopefully encourage you if it's something you want to do, or at least, you know, maybe give you a better idea of where you stand if you feel like this is urgent and it needs to happen right now, or if it's something you want to think about for a little while. Um, I found that to be really helpful to me and help me make my decision. Um, yeah, I would say you can talk to a fertility specialist anytime and you don't have, it, that doesn't mean that you've decided. That doesn't mean the process is starting. You can ask them your questions and see what their recommendations are. Um, and then particularly to like our medical students and residents, I would say like talk to your programs about this, right? Like this is something that not every program offers. And if you're a resident, maybe it's something that you can start to have your program offer. And then if you're applying as a medical student, Asking about fertility coverage should be something that is appealing to programs, right? Because it means that you're, you're not going to take maternity leave. So um, there are programs that have offered fertility coverage partly because they know that this is like your most fertile time and they are concerned about losing their workforce. And so this is something that you can advocate to them and say, hey, you know what? We should offer fertility benefits for our residents so they can preserve fertility. Um, and I think more and more, the more discussions that we have about this and the more that we advocate for this, the, the better coverage that we'll be able to have. Great, great tips. I think we all have left this talk having some idea of what we need to do next to preserve our fertility. So I just wanted to thank each of the panelists, Dr. Carrillo, Dr. Gonzalez, Dr. Alloy, 
Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us, for being so candid. I know this can be a somewhat personal topic, so I appreciate you all being willing to share your experiences with us. Thank you to each one of you who joined uh, this conversation tonight. Just so everyone's aware, this conversation will be uploaded to the American Academy of Emergency Medicine's Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusions website, so on the AEM website, as well as on the AEM YouTube page. So this will be out there if you want to re-listen to this webinar um, and get some more specifics you can definitely do that. And please share with your colleagues. You can share with your colleagues, you can share with your friends, um, anyone who has maybe talked about wanting to do this process but doesn't know where to get started. This is the perfect uh, webinar to share with them. And one final plug is that uh, AEM Jedi has a mentorship series. This is part of the mentorship series. So about every month we cover different topics. Usually it's led by Dr. Kristen Fontes. I'm another Kristen who's stepping in tonight, but um, we cover different topics about interviewing for residency, um, how to handle your first year out as an attending. So there are a lot of different topics that are coming down the pike. So please, 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 if you haven't already, um, join the AM Jedi uh, listserv so you can stay up to date on all our wonderful events. Thank you again to all the panelists. I learned so much tonight. Thank you. Bye everyone. <laughs>